Okay, so welcome to session one of uh, reparations as academic funding. Um, my name is Dr. Vanessa Goodar. I'm a recent graduate of National Lewis University. I actually just walked across the stage last month. And um, I am a graduate of the community psychology. Thank you, Miyandi. Thank you. Um, graduate of the community psychology department. And um, I'm actually an adjunct in that department as well, um, co teaching, cross cultural uh, communication dynamics. And um, also, by day, I'm a school teacher in Chicago Public Schools, and I am a researcher that um, focuses on cultural community self care action as it relates to Black women. So uh, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing you to uh, someone new to our community, uh, Ms. Mackenzie Isaac. And uh, I came across Ms. Isaac's work um, actually in attending conference for an organization that we both belong to um, that focuses on service to all mankind. And Mackenzie did an amazing job in sharing her experience of um, engaging in academic funding applications and what that experience was like as a black woman to um, apply to her, um, her experience that she's going to be working with with Oxford, as well as, you know, the other opportunities that um, may have created some barriers to uh, access for her. So um, I wanted to share a little bit about why we're doing this. So um, in order to address the demands of the SCRA call to action on anti-Blackness, um, this interest group, the SCRA United States Reparations Interest Group has co-designed a series of two workshops with Rhodes Scholar-elect Mackenzie Isaac. And our hope is to address um, three specific um, outcomes from the call to Blackness. And number one was to put tangible resources back into Black communities. Number two, to acknowledge the complicity and maintenance of white supremacy and white supremacy culture. And number three, we want to engage in collective action to dismantle anti-Blackness and white supremacy in SCRA and community psychology by specifically nurturing and supporting Black scholars and Black scholarship. So with this series, we're hoping to incite a revolutionary healing power of just knowing one's worth if you identify as a Black scholar. We would like to demystify the long competitive and rigorous processes of applying for academic funding. We'd like to discuss the navigation of imposter syndrome and self-doubt to pursue, to pursue these prestigious um, academic opportunities. Uh, we wanna acknowledge, acknowledge and celebrate the presence of black scholars in well-regarded academic institutions, encourage leadership within the SPRA community to decolonize research and pedagogy, and to introduce more black and other marginalized students to the array of academic scholarships and fellowships available. So Mackenzie Isaac is a graduate of the University of Notre Dame and Teachers College, um, Columbia and Columbia University. And Mackenzie identifies as a health educator, a diversity, equity, and inclusion advocate, an inspiring social epidemiologist, and lifelong freedom dreamer. Mackenzie's work aligns with the, the demands of the SCRA call to action on anti-Blackness and the mission of the SCRA Reparations Interest Group. She truly believes in the power of Black scholars reclaiming time and space through robust and representative scholarship. So without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Ms. Mackenzie Isaac. Thank you so much for that beautiful and gracious introduction, Dr. Goodar. So I will get right into it. Let me make sure that my screen is shareable really quickly. Okay, 
So many of you all have probably heard this talk marketed so far as academic funding as reparations, and that's precisely what this is, but I really wanted to reframe it in talking about it today as the revolutionary healing work of securing the bag. So what does that mean? Let's get into it, but I feel that before we really delve into the content today, I owe you all transparency. Uh, meaning that I wanted to share that in trying to formulate content for this presentation, I actually encountered a, a pretty significant mental block. And I realized that that mental block came from my own imposter syndrome, feeling like um, there was no way I held any sort of qualifications or I could position myself as a subject matter expert on what it means to use academic funding as reparations and how to reconceptualize reparations overall. I'm not ta Coates. <laughs> I am not attempting to be ta Coates in this talk, but I realized that the self-doubt that was keeping me from putting pen to paper to share information with you guys today came from my own need to unlearn the idea that women who look like me and come from my background are not qualified to speak on these things or what I have to say, the story that I have to share, the approach that I take and the lens that I basically employ isn't worth taking seriously. So with that in mind, I really wanted to lead all of us in an exercise today, selfishly, because it's also part of my own internal healing work. Um, but hopefully um, this idea that someone who looks like me presenting on a subject like this becomes a little bit more um, feasible and a little bit more um, viable <laughs> to you all by going through this. Um, so with that said, I want to do what I call decluttering our bias rooms, our bias rooms just being um, our brains. So um, I want you guys to position yourselves in a room. Imagine a room, maybe close your eyes if it helps you with the visualization. Close your eyes and picture a room. And in that room are shelves and shelves and boxes of all the biases and preconceived notions that you have about what an academic looks like, what scholarship looks like, what reparations look like. Now in that corner, in a corner of that room, I want you to find a broom. There's a broom there. I want you to pick up that broom. I want you to look at how cluttered your bias room is right now. And I want you to make a very deliberate decision to do some spring cleaning today. So I'm gonna ask you a series of questions to help you sweep up that room using your broom. First question, who has traditionally been the face of international scholarships and fellowships? And tucked in that question are a couple other questions. Who comes to mind when you hear the term scholarship benefactor? What does that person look like? What's the color of their skin? What's their gender identity? What's their socioeconomic status? What's their age? Who gives out scholarships? And embedded in that question, who comes to mind when you hear the term scholarship recipients? Who receives scholarships? What does that person look like? What's the color of their skin? What's their gender identity and socioeconomic status? What is their age? How do they speak? How do they move? Then I want you to move to another part of the room and you find a box and it's labeled academic advising. And around that box, there's a bunch of clutter. Who comes to mind when you hear the term subject matter expert? Sweep up whoever comes to mind when you hear the term subject matter expert. What is the color of that person's skin? What's their gender identity? What's their socioeconomic status? What is their age? 
How do they speak? How do they move? Then right next to that box, there's another box. It's a little bit smaller, but it has the words Rhodes Scholarship on it. And when you hear this term Rhodes Scholarship, what images race across your mind? What sort of people, places, narratives, ways of thinking do you associate with the term? I'm gonna repeat the term, Rhodes Scholarship. What sorts of institutions do you associate with the term? What sorts of activities? What sorts of political, social, cultural, economic orientations? What academic and career paths immediately come to mind? I want you to take that room, sweep up all of those preconceived notions, sweep them all up, choose a corner of the room, and tuck that clutter into the corner of the room. And then on the opposite end of the room, you see an enormous wardrobe filled with dust and moths and mothballs. You're not even sure where to really begin in decluttering that wardrobe. So you decide you're gonna try to take your arms and with all your strength, just push it aside the whole wardrobe. And that wardrobe is named reparations. When you hear that word reparations, what's the first material item that comes to mind? If your answer is money, then congratulations because that's what everyone else is thinking. What's the second material item that comes to mind when you think of reparations? Make sure that that wardrobe, nice and locked up, push as hard as you can, push it into a corner, until the center of your room is completely empty and ready to receive what this space has to offer. You can open your eyes. And I'm hoping that through doing this decluttering process with me, where there initially wasn't space to necessarily receive what a, a 23 year old black woman, who I should note has um, fewer than 18 months cumulatively of full time work experience um, to date, where, where there wasn't room to kind of receive my testimony. Hopefully, there's more space for you to receive that testimony. But not only that, um, be more willing to be radically vulnerable in your own testimony and think about how our stories can be used in tandem with one another to amplify other voices and make sure other stories are heard and how that can be accomplished through the redistribution of academic funding and the reimagination of who academic funding can belong to, where we can find it, who can secure it. So a little bit about me and why I'm here. I am the product of a beloved community that consists primarily of um, the, the descendants of African slaves. I'm not sure where. I imagine it was in West Africa, but I do know my roots here in the United States. My grandparents come from Greenwood, Mississippi, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Atmore, Alabama, in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Now under Greenwood, Mississippi, you're gonna see something called the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek because I am also the descendant of a man called Greenwood LaFleur and he decided to give over Choctaw Nation grounds um, to, to the French some time ago, way back in the early 1800s. Um, and that led to displacement that then had an impact on uh, the people who were also owned as slaves on that land, as well as the, the Native Americans on that land. In Atmore, Alabama, um, you're also gonna, you see a term fugitive academics. Um, so when I received my master's in health education this May, I became a seventh generation black female educator in my family. Does that mean that my family has been free or emancipated for seven generations? 
No, not quite. What that does mean is that my five times great grandmother was a champion for literacy when her own literacy was considered illegal, when her when the acknowledgement of her very humanity was considered unlawful, illogical, and not supported by the pseudoscientific standards of that day. And those standards still linger in academia today, which ties directly back to the argument I want to make today that we need to diversify academia to start undoing and unraveling those exact same legacies that caused my five times great grandmother all the way up to my great grandmother to be fugitive academicians um, instead of academicians that were acknowledged for the legitimacy of their wisdom and knowledge. So a little bit about my personal educational journey leading up to becoming a seventh generation black female educator. I went to a high school called Cathedral High School in Indianapolis, Indiana, where I was the first black female valedictorian in their at the time 98 year history. Um, and a little bit about that that's motivating my work now is that the parents of some of my peers were very indiscreet in their displeasure at me becoming a valedictorian. And so 15 valedictorians were named and we each gave about minute long valedictory addresses. Um, and they were chosen based off of standards that were unprecedented for the high school. That wasn't my first exposure to gendered racism, also known as um, misogyny noir, gendered anti-Black racism, but that's what really pushed me to think about what I wanted um, my mark to be on the academy so that um, other Black girls didn't have to go through trauma such as that. I then went to the University of Notre Dame, obtained my bachelor's degree in sociology, and then after completing a term with AmeriCorps, where I was a community organizer for health promotion, I attended Teachers College, Columbia University, um, where I pursued a degree in health education. And that's where my passion for social and spatial epidemiology um, really kind of fomented and was solidified. Um, and so with that sort of solidification of my passions, understanding my stakes in the work, understanding how I wanted to contribute to my own survival and the survival of the people I love through my research, I applied for the Rhodes Scholarship. Not once, but twice, and the second time around, um, they saw fit to invest in the communities and work that I deem most important. And so I will be doing my second master's thesis and subsequently my PhD dissertation on social and spatial epidemiology of disordered eating behaviors. All right. So something that I encountered when I applied for the, the Rhodes Scholarship, it was primarily online vitriol. So people didn't necessarily say this to my face, was people who questioned my intentions in taking a scholarship that was created in the name of someone who was basically a, a, a forefather of apartheid South Africa and um, whose work on the African continent through the diamond mining industry um, contributed to like cattle slavery, labor exploitation of black people, black bodies, black lives and who initially in his will did not imagine anyone like me receiving this scholarship. Um, and so here you'll see a photo of one of the first cohorts of Rhodes Scholars in the early 20th century, up top in gray, you're going to see all men, all white men, who Cecil Rhodes, um, who's the namesake of the Rhodes Trust, kind of imagined winning the scholarship across time. Um, people who could kind of expand uh, the British Commonwealth, who could expand colonial and um, and paternalistic ideals across the world so that white Western European standards became the standards of, of pedagogy and of policy, even pre-World Wars. But then below that photo, you're gonna see a photo from the early 80s, shortly after women were admitted into the program. But even then, you're gonna see some, you're gonna see some white women, you're gonna see some black men. There is a notable demographic of people who are missing in this photo, and that's Black women, who I'm sure that you guys are all familiar with the with Kimberly Crenshaw's um, idea of intersectionality. 
But even when the Rhodes Trust was initially adjusted, it didn't account for the compounding, how identities can compound injustice and how people with layered marginalized identities might be able to offer a new and very essential perspective on what it means to work and research and disseminate knowledge in service to justice for everyone. So then you have me, um, who Cecil Rhodes was probably, he's probably rolling in his grave right now. I'm talking about using his money as a form of reparations, but I stand in the belief that my securing of this scholarship is not just about me being frivolous in taking whoever's money without being intentional about reflecting on the legacy. It's about the poetic justice that comes with using someone's funds to overturn a legacy that they perpetuated. And I think that there's so much capacity to do that within academia at large and not within, and not just within such a small sort of esoteric subset as the Rhodes Scholarship. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more in depth about the importance of considering legacy and pursuing funding and reparations overall more extensively in part two. So what's on the menu today? Four things, the first, we're going to talk a little bit about anti-Blackness in academia, and I will say in this first section, I run the risk of preaching hard to the choir, probably preaching to some senior pastors in here, so I, I appreciate in advance the grace you will give me. Um, Black women are subject matter experts in almost every realm of knowledge in existence, yet misogynoir in knowledge production and dissemination is still alive and well. So we're going to talk about sort of the, the real world modern day implications of anti-Blackness in academia. And let's make no mistake here, the ivory tower's money habits don't just impact academicians, diverse academicians who are looking to spread knowledge. It impacts the lives and the livelihoods of literally everyone else. Um, and how, how does that manifest? We're going to talk a little bit about that. And then we're going to talk about um, white supremacy in academic workspaces, in the academy. And this white supremacist question, it's a fundamentally racist question, who's worthy of our money? Um, and so I'm going to discuss how we can kind of reframe traditional criteria for pursuing academic funding for ourselves as applicants and also as decision makers so what was so that what was meant to perpetuate white supremacy can now be used to upend it. And then lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit about Ta-Nehisi Coates, um, the true subject matter expert who's, on whose shoulders I stand today. He offers a radical methodology for quantifying what is owed and making demands accordingly. But he is looking at it particularly within the context of housing. And this was in 2014. And a lot has changed. We've, we've lit and extinguished several dumpster fires since 2014. So how do we apply this methodology to securing academic funding today? We're going to find out together through a bit of an orientation to part two of this presentation, which will take place in August. So let's talk about anti-Blackness in academia first. What are all the different faces of anti-Blackness in academia? What is the so-called academic apartheid that Dr. Chan J. Drake discusses extensively um, in his writings? So the first is the denial of tenure. Some of you guys might know that Drs. Nicole Hannah-Jones and Drs. and Cornell West were denied tenure from uh, their institutions, UNC Chapel Hill and Harvard Divinity School, respectively, even though they had already cemented themselves as trailblazers in their field. But because of standards of tenure, because of the public or parish narrative, um, because of um, UNC Chapel Hill in particular's unwillingness to stand firmly with the 1619 project that was established by Nicole Hannah-Jones because of fear of confrontation, fear of making those powerful dis uncomfortable. Um, these are people who are members of the academy, but not in uh, the official capacity that um, the academy sort of deems as like legitimate knowledge producers, which is mind blowing because they are two powerhouses, um, stalwarts, in uh, academic spaces. Um, but then when we look at securing funding 
to buy into that publisher parish narrative. There are often objectives and timelines that um, call for proposals and grant distributors ask for that are not in alignment with what a community necessarily needs. And the metrics for success set out by people who distribute funds for research might be seen by a community member as that's not what we need. Your metrics of success aren't our metrics for success. Your perspective on equitable outcomes is not our perspective. That's not what we as a community said that we needed, but you wouldn't know that because you didn't dignify us with a conversation. Um, so even this idea of um, equitable versus inequitable, successful versus unsuccessful within the year, two year, five year timelines that grants are distributed, um, feed into binary thinking and constant senses of urgency that are actually remnants of white supremacy in the workplace. Whose timelines are we operating on? Um, when are community members, the people who are being served deemed uncompliant? Who's deemed non-compliant? the quickest? And how does that feed into um, how inclusive and culturally relevant our approaches are in collecting community-informed data? And then, of course, there's white saviorism. And this manifests itself in so many different ways in the academy as well. Denial of discriminatory behavior when it happens. So micro and macro aggressions being invalidated as people come across them. Avoidance of tension or conflict as an inadequate proxy for allyship and white guilt as an inadequate proxy for mutual accountability. So what do these things specifically mean? It means that um, whenever someone is being called out or called inward for something harmful or off color that they said, the instinct shouldn't be to cry, the instinct shouldn't be to be defensive um, or to change the subject. Because in doing that, you take an, erase, an eraser to someone's spirit and that can wear them down in mind, body, and soul. And it's really a public health issue that we'll delve into in just a couple of slides. And then there's the fallacy of oversimplifying other people's problems as a sort of byproduct of white saviorism and white supremacy in the academy. So what does this mean specifically? I'll draw you a quick picture. This is an example that I always lean on. So imagine there is a student from Ghana Say it's a, an academician from Ghana, and they are intrigued by um, the, the gun violence epidemic in the United States. And they decide to dedicate their, their academic research to solving gun violence. They come to the United States, they interact with communities very minimally, and then they gain access to a few high level decision makers. And they say, well, the answer is simple here. You just need to find a way to take away people's guns. You need to implement, um, you need to implement self-defense and anti-violence training in all of the workplaces that you have. Um, you need to heighten security in schools and public places, public institutions, and there you have it. It's done. I just solved gun violence. I don't understand how you haven't seen it before. Now, if this sounds absurd, it's because it is. But this is exactly what a lot of American researchers do when they go to other countries. They will go to other countries and they will take these enormous looming issues that are steeped in history, steeped in laws, steeped in norms of exclusion and marginalization. And they'll say, well, the answer here is simple. I've just solved your problem. And so the oversimplification of other people's problems without understanding the complexities um, of what's keeping progress from from moving forward with what's enabling stagnation is that's based, it's a byproduct of thinking, I know the answer and I'm gonna give it to you. And if you don't implement it, then this no longer is something that I can ascribe to 
my complicity in the problem or a systemic issue. It's individual non-compliance. As a health educator, non-compliance is a very, <laughs> um, it's a very touchy word for me because you hear it so often when people oversimplify other people's problems. And then there's the unpaid and often invisible labor of DEI advocacy and unsupported mentorship. At the University of Notre Dame, most especially, the very few Black faculty members who we had, they mentored everyone. They served on every steering committee. They attended every event. They advised the Black Student Union and the Caribbean Students Association, the African Students Association, the Asian Students Association, um, whenever there was a panel that was needed to talk about anything related to race or racism, they had to coordinate it. Never mind the fact that they still had positions, sometimes tenure track, sometimes not, that required the same amount of intellectual labor as any other faculty or staff member on campus. And within that, there's this inclusion tax having to coordinate these events, these initiatives and mentor while also remaining palatable without shaking the table so much that you jeopardize not only your position at your institution, but your standing within the academy. Um, and this inclusion tax definitely extends to students as well. Students who want to affect change, but might not find the needed support among faculty or staff members or in the institution at large because it might shape the status quo too much. And because the students aren't the ones holding the purse strings, um, they're not the ones who are able to unravel some of the larger issues that need to be addressed. And then lastly, hair and skin and the politics of representation in the academy. And this is something that hits close to home for both Black men and Black women. It is shown that even as the academy becomes more inclusive in name and principle, people with natural hair and people with darker skin often find that when they enter into the academy, when they infiltrate that space, they receive disparate treatment out of not appearing desirable, as if desirability should be a metric of a person's intellectual contribution but they find micro and macro aggressions that push them out of the academy because they feel that people are so fixated on how they look and how they're perceived as a threat or even when they enter into academic spaces how if you don't have your key card to enter into your academic building someone might not let you in because they don't think that you belong in that space those things i call them death by a million paper cuts they they break down your spirit in a way that students see. I saw it and observed it as an undergraduate student, and it makes you question whether the academy is a space that I should enter for my own personal safety, even if I feel like I have meaningful knowledge to contribute. So I put not coherently articulated kind of in big, bold font here, because when I was applying for the University of Oxford, applying to the University of Oxford, which is um, little known to a lot of people, something you still have to do and could still not be successful at upon achieving the Rhodes um, Scholarship. I was in an interview about my work in health education, talking about my objectives, talking about my methodologies, talking about my passion for ethnography, bringing auto ethnography into my work because I can't separate who I am from the questions that I find important to ask um, in academia. And I received an email after that interview and they said, we don't want to offer you a spot right now because we don't think that what you want to do is coherently articulated. And that is something that resonated with me. Even now that I've gotten into a program and will be heading to Oxford in the fall, not under the supervision of the particular faculty member who said that, thankfully, I still carry the idea of not being coherently articulate with me always, because I took that as an affront to not just my intellectual capacity, but the work that I deemed important in the communities that I thought were meaningful to elevate, as well as the methodologies that were important. Numbers, looking at things at a systematic level, it's engaging, it's interesting, it's important. And we can't talk about reparations without highlighting the quantitative. But what about stories? 
What about the subject matter expertise of lived and living experiences? To say that those aren't coherently articulated, to me, I associate that with the white supremacist way of thinking where oral histories and storytelling and ethnography are not prioritized um, because they're not using technical skill sets that you have to get an education to build upon. And that education is just not accessible to many people, many of people of which do not look like me, but could probably run circles around academicians when it comes to just the grasp of reality and how to change it in service to justice. So with that in mind, here is just a bit of a breakdown of academic ranking within the academy, um, gender and race. So here you can see anti-Blackness made evident through the numbers. So, you know, if you like the quantitative, I'm gonna give that to you too. I'm just gonna provide the story that underlies it. But here are the numbers here. So you are going to see that the statistics, some of them for mixed race people are, are negligible. The, the pound keys, the hashtags round to zero. That means that they're almost completely invisible within these spaces. But you see the Black men versus the Black women who are represented in academia, making up tiny, tiny proportions that are not even representative of the United States population. And this underrepresentation has to be tackled before we even talk about the need for actually over representation. We know about oversampling in research and how important it is to make sure that everyone's narratives are captured. But before we could talk about over representing more Black people in academia, we have to talk about this lack of representation and how this was in 2020. And these statistics haven't changed very much in the past half a century. And it's because students will observe who the academy deems worthy, whose knowledge and experiences and inherent wisdom they deem worthy, and they'll run to other professions and with good reason. Or they will see opportunities for academic funding to go into non-academic professions and they'll say, those are not inviting or safe spaces for me. And for a lot of the past half century, that was true. They were not safe or affirming spaces, but even as they evolve, even as I sit here as a Rhodes Scholar, People shy away, they self-select out of these opportunities for a variety of reasons we'll discuss. So it should come as no surprise then <laughs> that there are major implications for community health and well-being that come with anti-Blackness in academia, not just for academicians, um, but for the community at large. What happens in the ivory tower bleeds out into the hills and valleys below um, and affect whether and how knowledge influences public discourse, practice, policy, and individual and family level well-being. So let's look at the consequences of our own actions as academic elites. So this is what I term the epidemiology of inaccess. And again, it's a bit of preaching to the choir, so I'm just gonna read through these, but there's a normalization of physical and mental illness among Black faculty and Black women are at heightened risk of stress-induced illness due to misogynoir or gendered anti-Black racism. And a, a social epidemiologist from UC Berkeley, a Black woman, actually found that um, chronic low-grade inflammation was actually extremely common among Black women with PhDs, which is basically a perpetual low fever. <laughs> so Black women are going into academic spaces with low fevers, chronic inflammation constantly because the stress that they're carrying is deemed normal. They wake up in the morning feeling sick and they go to work and that's just their norm. That's a major issue. That is on account of classroom aggressions, aggressions received by their students and their colleagues, the psychological wear and tear of existing on campuses that were built on the black backs of enslaved black people on lands that more often than not were stolen from First Nations with efforts to make amends being either slow, behind the scenes, or not existing at all. 
There's also knowledge gaps in the areas of community psychology, chronic disease, prevention and management, criminal justice, environmental justice, the list keeps going on and on because when anti-Black racism exists in the academy, people are pushed out of producing new knowledge that incorporates the perspectives of samples and research subjects and quote unquote target populations, acknowledging that target is a very violent word in, uh, in academia and otherwise that aren't that aren't as easily accessible. Um, and so that perpetuates mistrust between academicians, the communities they investigate and serve, and other stakeholders because the data that's being used to enact interventions are untenable, unsustainable, not made in the image of Black people. Whose work gets published and where makes a profound statement regarding not only whose work matters, but whose lives matters. So, Case in point, tangible example. We think about how young black kids are about twice as likely than white kids their age to contract asthma, due primarily to environmental factors. But let's talk about asthma mitigation for a second. Not only are black kids more susceptible to asthma, they're more susceptible to lasting asthma, chronic asthma, and asthma mortality. And a big reason beyond environmental factors for that is that clinical trials do not include Black people so that when the medicine is peddled out, Black kids do not respond to the medicine that's given. The medicine was not made in the image of them or with an understanding of their anatomies or how the environments they're still living in dealing with asthma might then counteract the medications. That's due to exclusion in clinical trials. Maternal mortality and the social factors, the genetic factors associated with preeclampsia and chronic stress leading to maternal mortality, largely understudied. All right, so let's talk about this, this idea, this, this fundamentally white supremacist question of who is worthy of our money. So when benefactors and when high level decision makers decide, okay, I want to fund a, a large research project. I have $5 million in five years to study um, a particular subject, let's say within community psychology and public health. I ask who's worthy of our money or when they think about, okay, we have 32 Rhodes scholarships to offer to Americans this year. Who's going to get that money? Whose futures are we going to invest in with this limited opportunity? Here are some of the principles that I argue are very white supremacist in nature, very anti-Black, I should be more specific, very anti-Black in nature that a lot of decisions I've noticed being in some decision-making spaces and nonprofit money distribution is based off of. It's based off of the capacity to achieve perfection. And so because of that capacity, you might find students who are applying for Rhodes scholarships or people who are applying for postdoctoral programs. Do I need a 4.0 GPA? They're looking for clear hierarchy, someone who is a leader in a visible way, someone who was elected by the majority, deemed worthy by the majority to spearhead an initiative. So you might find students and candidates saying, but I wasn't president of the organization. I'm not the leader of this research group. I don't have much principal investigation experience. And then they look for things that are culturally and politically aligned with the status quo, things that will that will shake the table without taking things off the table, without swiping things off the table and clearing it for conversations about justice. So you find students, candidates saying, my opinion's too radical. I think I might be shaking the table a little too much. I'm not palatable. I'm gonna come off as mean. I'm gonna come off as the angry black woman. If I decide to be vulnerable about my experiences, they're gonna throw my story out of the window because it's too sentimental in a research space. They also look for focusing, things that focus on individual rather than communal credentials. They look for things that were accomplished by a single person or a single entity as a marker of success. Um, rather than collective efforts, because something that I um, 
was criticized pretty heavily on by my university when I was named a finalist for the Rhodes Scholarship. I would do these mock interviews and they would say, tell me about, you know, your greatest accomplishment to date. And I would always start out with when we, and they said, no, it's not about we, it's about you. You did this. And while owning your contributions is so essential and important in claiming this funding, that whole idea that it's a mission and a journey of I rather than we is, um, is a very kind of capitalist, neoliberal, and ultimately white supremacist content um, kind of lens through which to view success. And then lastly, high qualities quantities of output, quality aside in short periods of time. So in writing my applications for the Rhodes Scholarship, my essays, they're like, how many hundreds of people did you impact? How many thousands of people did you impact? Well, my whole essay was about a life-changing conversation that I had with a group of teenagers. When I talked in my interview about what it meant to me to teach six teenage, Black teenage boys how to play hopscotch. And I use hopscotch as an extended metaphor for what it means to be safe in your own neighborhood. Um, who deserves joy? Who deserves recreation? Those six weren't impactful enough for them. How many hundred people? What's the, what are the percentages behind it? How did you transform a system? And how long did that conversation take? What else did you do? Once again, statements to not only what work matters, but whose lives matter, whose stories count, and whose impact counts. Just so, a really quick um, pop in. Uh, we only yeah. have a few minutes left. Oh, uh, wow. We're, going back to, we're running out of time. We only have about six minutes left. So um, we're going to close with this slide and maybe just like allow this conversation to pour over into our next session. Absolutely. So um, after this slide, can we go ahead and go into Q&A? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think this is a good ending point as well. So talking about, because this is part four here, reclaiming. So in thinking about these sort of five white supremacist ideas of who's worthy of people's money, money and academic funding, let's reframe these ideas. So here's a word to an aspiring, because we're always working towards it, anti-racist decision maker. Um, so if you ever find yourself making decisions on who receives scholarships, who receives funding, or if you find yourself wanting to self-select out of receiving money yourself, remember these things. Perfection should not be the aim. Power should be less concentrated and knowledge should be democratized. Those in power are not entitled to more emotional or psychological comfort than anyone else. So avoiding conflict and confrontation is very counterproductive to pushing the needle in the academy and beyond. Individualism is not an indicator that someone is more successful than another person who is we-oriented as opposed to I-oriented. And lastly, progress does not always mean bigger, more, or quicker. Um, and so with that, I'm just going to show you guys are probably familiar with the Bronfenbrenner uh, ecological systems theory, but this is just a bit of a taste or a sneak peek into part two, how we're going to talk about how to take those anti-racist principles, that reframing of white supremacist principles, and apply them to every level of impact so that you as an academic just can secure your bag and create a pipeline for other people to secure theirs to change the face of knowledge production and sharing in service to justice. So with that, we can definitely open it up to Q&A. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Mackenzie. Um, I just wanna bring, I know we only have like a couple minutes left, but please, please, please uh, direct your attention to the chat. There is a um, Google Doc uh, form there and Mackenzie and I are still, um, creating a participatory process here. So we would like to uh, adjust and adapt uh, part two as much as possible based on this teacher um, concept of KWL. So what did you know about academic funding as it relates to reparations? What did you want to know about this concept? And uh, what did you learn from um, Mackenzie's presentation? Um, please, um, if you could do us a favor and, um, engage with that that form so that we can 
perfect, not perfect, because we don't want to do that, right, Mackenzie? But uh, we want to uh, adjust and adapt the presentation next month based on your feedback. So that uh, form can be found in the chat. And for these last couple minutes, I would love to open up. Anybody can pop off of mute and just ask a really quick question. If you guys have more time, I have about 15 minutes. I'm not sure about you, Mackenzie. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if, if you guys have time, uh, we do have um, you know a little bit of time after um, the call ends to uh, continue with Q&A, but I'm gonna pause there and see if anybody would like to come off of mute and ask uh, Mackenzie a question about her experiences in navigating academic funding opportunities at elite levels.